Here are helpful nursing practice questions that may help you. Please like and subscribe for more videos like this. The client is brought to the emergency department after falling off a roof and landing on his back. AT1 spinal fracture is diagnosed. The client's blood pressure is 74 40ths of a millimeter Hg, pulse is 50 per minute, and skin is pink and dry. What nursing action is a priority? 1. Administer IV normal saline. 2. Determine if urinary occult blood is present. 3. Perform a neurological assessment. 4. Verify that there is no stool impaction. Correct answer. Explanation. This presentation is classic for neurogenic shock, a distributive shock. Vascular dilation with decreased venous return to the heart is present due to loss of innervation from the spine. Classic signs, symptoms are hypotension, bradycardia, and pink and dry skin from the vasodilation. Neurogenic shock usually occurs in cervical or high thoracic injuries, T6 or higher. Systolic blood pressure should remain at 80 mm Hg or above to adequately perfuse the kidneys. Administration of fluids is a priority to ensure adequate kidney and other organ perfusion. Option 2. Testing for the presence of blood in the urine is important in determining if kidney damage has occurred, but circulation stability is a priority. Option 3. A neurological assessment is essential, but circulation stability is a priority. C before D. Disability. Option 4. Bladder and stool impaction are etiologies for autonomic dysreflexia and generally occur in a client with a high-level fracture at T6 or above with a stimulation below the fracture. Autonomic dysreflexia is a medical emergency that presents with severe headache, hypertension, piloerection, and diaphoresis. It is seen weeks to years after the injury. Educational objective. Neurogenic shock, distributive shock can occur from vasodilation soon after spinal injury. Classic symptoms are hypotension, bradycardia, and pink and dry skin. The hypotension must be treated with isotonic fluids to maintain vital organ perfusion. An emergency department nurse is sent to the scene of a massive motor vehicle collision. A client there reports neck pain. Which actions should the nurse perform at this time? Select all that apply. 1. Apply a hard cervical collar. 2. Assess neck range of motion. 3. Inspect client's respiratory pattern. 4. Position client flat on firm surface. 5. Use log rolling technique if moving client. Correct answer. The initial priorities for a client with a suspected cervical spine injury are to ensure a patent airway and immobilize the spine to prevent further injury. This includes applying a rigid hard collar, placing the client on a firm surface, e.g., a backboard, and moving the client as a unit, log rolling, if required, options 1, 4, and 5. A soft foam cervical collar does not provide immobilization. Further stabilization is achieved by taping down the client's head and using straps to immobilize the arms, especially if the client is not cooperating. After immobilizing the client, the nurse should obtain a baseline set of vital signs to monitor for neurogenic shock, e.g., hypotension, bradycardia, poikilothermia, i.e., inability to regulate body temperature, a potential complication of spinal cord injury. The nurse should also assess the client's respiratory rate, pattern, and effort. Presence of abdominal breathing or increased work of breathing may indicate impending loss of airway and require prompt rapid sequence intubation, option 3. Option 2. Movement of the neck, upper extremities should be avoided until cervical spine injury is ruled out with imaging, which is done after the spine is immobilized with a hard collar. Educational Objective. The priorities for a client with a suspected cervical spine injury are maintaining a patent airway and spinal immobilization. Interventions include application of a rigid hard collar, placing the client on a firm surface, log rolling the client during movement and transfers, and continued assessment of need for an advanced airway.
which would be the appropriate client criteria for activating a rapid response team at the hospital. Select all that apply. DCS, score of 9 throughout shift. 2. Heart rate remaining at 58 beats per minute for more than 1 hour. 3. Postoperative pain rated at 10. 4. Respiratory rate maintaining an increase to 30 breaths per minute. 5. Sustained change in level of consciousness for 10 minutes. Correct answer. The rapid response team is activated to marshal additional experienced and specialized resources for an acute need to try to prevent a client from deterioration into a code, arrest situation. The team has critical care expertise to provide immediate attention to unstable clients in non-critical care units and usually consists of a respiratory therapist, a critical care nurse, and a physician or advanced practice registered nurse. Recommended criteria to consider according to the Institute for Healthcare Improvement include the following. An acute change in any of the following. Heart rate less than 40 or greater than 130 per minute. Systolic blood pressure less than 90 mm Hg. Respiratory rate less than 8 or greater than 28 per minute. Option 4. Oxygen saturation less than 90 despite oxygen. Urine output less than 50 ml 4 hour. Level of consciousness, option 5. Option 1, the GCS is abnormal but is stable in the abnormality. A rapid response would be used for a significant deteriorating trend. Option 2, many clients routinely run a slowed pulse rate, athletes. There is no indication that this is a new change for the client. It would be concerning if there was an effect on perfusion accompanied by chest pain, or if the heart rate was less than 40 per minute. Option 3, unrelieved pain is concerning, but the nurse can handle this through assessing the etiology, calling the healthcare provider, or adjusting the analgesia. Pain in and of itself is not an indication of client instability. Educational Objective Rapid response criteria for unstable clients in a non-acute care setting usually include sudden, significant changes that do not respond to treatment. When caring for a client with a left radial artery catheter, which assessment data obtained by the nurse indicates the need to take immediate action. 1. Capillary refill of less than 3 seconds. 2. Left hand cooler than right. 3. Mean arterial pressure of 65 mm Hg. 4. Pressure bag at 300 mm Hg. Correct answer. Although the Allen's test is performed before cannulating the radial artery and determines the adequacy of ulnar artery blood flow, circulation to the extremity is monitored frequently. The nurse must assess color, capillary refill, sensation, temperature, and movement per institution policy. Impairment in any of these parameters must be reported immediately because it may indicate impaired circulation to the extremity, and removal of the catheter may be necessary. Option 1. Capillary refill of less than 3 seconds is an indicator of normal arterial circulation. Option 3. A mean arterial pressure of 65 mm Hg is adequate to perfuse the vital organs. Option 4, to maintain patency of the arterial blood pressure monitoring system, an intravenous bag of normal saline solution is placed in a pressure infuser device. The device is set to maintain continual pressure at 300 mm Hg. The pressure drops as the volume of solution in the bag decreases and can be pumped back up. This does not pose an immediate threat to the client. Educational Objective when caring for a client with a radial, brachial, or femoral arterial line in place. The nurse must be able to assess for complications. These include hemorrhage, infection, thrombus formation, and circulatory and neurovascular impairment. A nurse in the emergency department is caring for a homeless client just brought in with frostbite to the fingers and toes. The client is experiencing numbness and assessment shows mottled skin. Which interventions should be included in the client's plan of care? Select all that apply. 1. Apply occlusive dressings after rewarming. 2. Elevate affected extremities after rewarming. 3. 
Massage the areas to increase circulation. 4. Provide adequate analgesia. 5. Provide continuous warm water soaks. Correct answer. Explanation. Frostbite involves tissue freezing, resulting in ice crystal formation in intracellular spaces that causes peripheral vasoconstriction, reduced blood flow, vascular stasis, and cell damage. Superficial frostbite can manifest as mottled, blue, or waxy yellow skin. Deeper frostbite may cause skin to appear white and hard and unable to sense touch. This can eventually progress to gangrene. Treatment of frostbite should include the following. Remove clothing and jewelry to prevent constriction. Do not massage, rub, or squeeze the area involved. Injured tissue is easily damaged. Option 3. Immerse the affected area in water heated to 98.6 to 102.2 F, 37 to 39 C, preferably in a whirlpool. Higher temperatures do not significantly decrease rewarming time but can intensify pain, option 5. Avoid heavy blankets or clothing to prevent tissue sloughing. Provide analgesia as the rewarming procedure is extremely painful, option 4. As thawing occurs, the injured area will become edematous and may blister. Elevate the injured area after rewarming to reduce edema, option 2. Keep wounds open immediately after a water bath or whirlpool treatment and allow them to dry before applying loose, non-adherent. Sterile dressings, option 1. Monitor for signs of compartment syndrome. Educational objective. Care of the client with frostbite focuses on preventing further injury and reducing pain. This includes removing items that can cause constriction or sloughing. No massaging or rubbing of the injured area. Providing warm water soaks and analgesia. Elevating injured areas. Applying loose non-adherent, sterile dressings, and monitoring for compartment syndrome. The nurse cares for an intubated client on mechanical ventilation with worsening cerebral edema from increased intracranial pressure, ICP. Which nursing interventions help reduce ICP? Select all that apply. 1. Clustering as many interventions as possible when providing care. 2. Hyperventilating before suctioning. 3. Maintaining a quiet, dark environment. 4. Maintaining the head in a neutral midline position. 5. Suctioning for 30 seconds to remove endotracheal tube secretions at regular intervals. Correct answer. Explanation. Most nursing activities increase intracranial pressure, IC, in brain injuries. The goal is to reduce ICP while managing basic client needs. During interventions, ICP should not exceed 25 mm Hg and should return to baseline within a few minutes. Metabolic demands, e.g., pain, straining, agitation, shivering, fever. Hypoxia, increase brain blood supply and raise ICP. Nursing interventions to control ICP include Elevating the head of the bed to 30 degrees with the head, neck in a neutral position to reduce venous congestion, option 4. Administering stool softeners to reduce the risk of straining, e.g. Valsalva maneuver. Managing pain well while monitoring sedation. Managing fever, e.g., cool sponges, ice, antipyretics, while preventing shivering. Maintaining a calm environment with minimal noise, e.g., alarms, television, hall noise, option 3. Ensuring adequate oxygenation, hyperventilating and pre-oxygenating the client before suctioning. Reducing CO2, a potent cerebral vasodilator, by hyperventilation induces vasoconstriction and reduces ICP, option 2. Option 1, stimulation increases oxygen metabolism within the brain, increasing the risk for irreversible brain damage and increased ICP. Limit performing interventions unless absolutely necessary and avoid performing interventions in clusters. Option 5. The nurse should suction a maximum of 10 seconds and only as necessary to remove secretions. Prolonged suctioning increases ICP. Educational objective. Nursing activities can increase intracranial pressure, IC, and should be limited and spread throughout the day.
The goal is to reduce ICP while managing basic needs. Nursing interventions include elevating the head of the bed, administering stool softeners, managing pain and fever, and maintaining a calm environment. The nurse is admitting a client with a possible diagnosis of Guillain-Barre syndrome. When collecting data to develop a plan of care for the client, the nurse should give priority to which of the following items. 1. Orthostatic blood pressure changes. 2. Presence or absence of knee reflexes. 3. Pupil size and reaction to light. 4. Rate and depth of respirations. Correct answer. Explanation. Guillain-Barre syndrome, GBS, is an acute, immune-mediated polyneuropathy that is most often accompanied by ascending muscle paralysis and absence of reflexes. Lower extremity weakness progresses over hours to days to involve the thorax, arms, and cranial nerves, CNs. Neuromuscular respiratory failure is the most life-threatening complication. The rate and depth of the respirations should be monitored. Option 4. Measurement of serial bedside forced vital capacity, spirometry, is the gold standard for assessing early ventilation failure. Option 1. Autonomic dysfunction is common in BS and usually results in orthostatic hypotension, paralytic ileus, urinary retention, and diaphoresis. These complications need to be assessed but are not a priority. Option 2. Absence of knee reflexes is expected early in the course of GBS due to the ascending nature of the disease. Absence of gag reflex indicates GBS progression. Option 3. PERRLA. Pupils equal. Round. Reactive to light. Accommodation. Evaluation assesses CNs 2, 3, IV, and V. CN abnormalities are expected after the thoracic muscles, respiratory, are involved due to the ascending nature of GBS. Educational objective. The most serious complication to monitor for in new-onset Guillain-Barre syndrome is respiratory compromise from the paralysis ascending into the thoracic region. Monitoring for rate, depth of respirations and measuring serial bedside vital capacity, spirometry, help to detect this early in the disease course. A client with palpitations is admitted with supraventricular tachycardia. The client's heart rate is 210 per minute. Which is the most appropriate initial intervention? 1. Ask the client to bear down as if having a bowel movement. 2. Grab the crash cart and apply hands-free defibrillation pads. 3. Place ECG leads on client to further assess electrical activity. 4. Place IV line distally from the heart for adenosine administration. Correct answer. Clients with paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia, street, regular, narrow QRS complex tachycardia, are initially treated with vagal maneuvers. The act of bearing down, as if having a bowel movement, valsalva, is an example of these maneuvers and may need to be attempted more than once. Vagal maneuvers work by increasing intrathoracic pressure and stimulating the vagus nerve, which supplies parasympathetic nerve fibers to the heart, resulting in slowed electrical conduction through the atrioventricular node. Option 2, cardioversion, not defibrillation, is used with this type of arrhythmia when it is refractory to medication. Cardioversion delivers a synchronized electrical current to the heart. This works by stopping the electrical activity to the heart and briefly allowing a normal heartbeat to return. Option 3, an ECG is used to diagnose street and can be obtained while or after the client is asked to perform the vagal maneuvers as it is not therapeutic. Option 4, adenosine is the drug of choice to treat street and has a 5 to 6 second half-life, the time it takes for the drug to be reduced to half of its original concentration. Placing the IV line as close as possible, not distal, to the heart is essential for the drug to have full effect. Adenosine is given rapidly over 1 to 2 seconds and then followed by a rapid 20 ml normal saline flush. Transient asystole is common, and clients often experience flushing and dizziness. Educational objective. 
Supraventricular tachycardia is a regular, narrow QRS complex tachycardia with a rate of around 150 to 220 per minute. The best treatment is vagal maneuvers and adenosine IV push. The nurse is supervising a graduate nurse, GN, on a telemetry unit. An assigned client develops asystole with no pulse, and emergency care interventions are initiated. Which action by the GN would cause the supervising nurse to intervene? 1. Administers IV epinephrine. 2. Applies oxygen with bag mask. 3. Initiates chest compressions. 4. Provides defibrillator shock. Correct answer. Explanation. The client in asystole has a total absence of ventricular electrical activity and is pulseless, apneic, and unresponsive. The nurse should first verify the monitor reading by assessing the client and palpating for a pulse, and then call for help and initiate emergency care, i.e., CPR, oxygenated ventilation. Defibrillation is not indicated when there is no electrical activity present, i.e., asystole or when the heart muscle is not contracting despite an organized rhythm, i.e., pulseless electrical activity, p. Defibrillation attempts to convert lethal ventricular dysrhythmias, i.e., ventricular fibrillation and pulseless ventricular tachycardia, into an organized rhythm by passing an electric shock through the heart. Defibrillation cannot create an organized rhythm if there is no electrical activity in the heart, option 4. Options 1, 2, and 3, immediate interventions for asystole and P include CPR and oxygenated ventilation. Advanced cardiovascular life support measures include epinephrine IV, placement of advanced airway, i.e. intubation, and treatment of reversible causes, e.g., hypovolemia, hyperkalemia. When treating systole or P, the absolute priority is providing continuous high-quality CPR and oxygenated ventilation until circulation spontaneously returns or the client enters into a shockable rhythm. Unfortunately, restoration of circulation may not be possible, and clients in asystole often cannot be resuscitated. Educational Objective Asystole is characterized by a total absence of ventricular electrical activity. The client is pulseless, apneic, and unresponsive. Treatment includes CPR, oxygenated ventilation, and advanced cardiovascular life support measures, e.g., epinephrine IV, advanced airway. Defibrillation is not effective for treatment of asystole or pulseless electrical activity. To obtain accurate continuous blood pressure readings via a radial arterial catheter, the nurse places the air-filled interface of the stopcock at the phlebostatic axis. Where is it located? 1. Angle of Lewis at second intercoastal space, ICS, to left of sternal border. 2. Aortic area at second ICS to right of sternal border. 3. Level of atria at 4th ICS, 1 half anterior posterior, AP, diameter. 4. 5 THICS at midclavicular line, MCL. Correct answer. Explanation. To measure pressures accurately using continual arterial and or pulmonary artery pressure monitoring, the zeroing stopcock of the transducer system must be placed at the phlebostatic axis. This anatomical location, with the client in the supine position, is at the 4th ICS. At the midway point of the AP diameter, 1 half AP, of the chest wall. If the transducer is placed too low, the reading will be falsely high. If placed too high, the reading will be falsely low. This concept is similar to the positioning of the arm in relation to the level of the heart when measuring blood pressure indirectly using a sphygmo manometer or non-invasive blood pressure monitoring device. The upper arm should be at the level of the phlebostatic axis. Option 1. The angle of Lewis is the palpable raised notch where the manubrium and sternum are joined. 
This anatomical location is useful in counting the ICSs and in finding auscultatory areas. Option 2, the aortic area is an auscultatory area located at the second ICS to the right of the sternal border. Option 4, the mitral area, apex, an auscultatory area, and the point of maximal impulse are located at the fifth ICS at the MCL. Educational Objective The anatomical location of the phlebostatic axis is the fourth ICS, at the midway point of the AP diameter, one half AP, of the chest wall. The stopcock nearest the transducer is placed here to assure accurate pressure measurements.